Oh, we're so happy to have uh, three of our amazing Ben Lujan fellows uh, this evening. Uh, we're definitely excited uh, to have you all join us and uh, being willing to, to share your thoughts, your reflections on these few questions that we have this evening. Um, if you don't mind, uh, Veronica, just let me know when we're ready to go. And yeah, everyone had a chance to um, review the questions. And um, we'll, um, if, if we're all good, if you could give me a thumbs up, we'll go ahead and, and move ahead. Yeah, and, uh, and start this thing off. Yeah, Adrian, uh, thank you so much for coordinating this with me and, and, and getting our, our esteemed panelists uh, here with us today. I, have, I am going to record this because uh, uh, this will be um, a pre-recorded session that will be shared with our faculty during our development days uh, that are coming up next week. So um, I would just like to thank you for participating uh, on a Thursday. I really appreciate it. And um, so um, Adrian, please uh, let me know how I can support, but otherwise I'm going to mute my mic and just uh, let you uh, take the reins here. We are recording. Terrific. So welcome back for another amazing semester. We have a tremendous treat for you this evening uh, with our Ben Lujan Leadership and Public Policy Institute Fellows. Um, out of the Center for the Education and Study of Diverse Populations, uh, directed uh, by uh, Mr. Ron Martinez. Ron, I don't know if you want to say good uh, good afternoon today. I just want to say welcome to everyone, and uh, again, inspire you to have a good semester. Um, I look a little rangy because I just took off my hat and been loading wood all afternoon, but nonetheless, uh, welcome everyone, and we look forward to really having the inspiration of and the enthusiasm of your own involvement within the uh, Ben Lujan Fellows Program to really kind of reflect how we can actually take your insights and make successors and successors that are coming and still staying involved within the Ben Lujan Leadership and Public Policy uh, Institute. The work that we do is paramount to the future, the future leadership of our schools and of our children and our students and families and communities. So I'd like to just preface all of that by saying, you know, our country is going through some dynamics right now where the profession of education is changing so much, so fast, so, you know, uh, the complexities are changing in, in dynamics that we're not used to or we're not prepared for. And your insights to how we can do a better job and better prepare ourselves for any of the futuristic uh, ideas and, and issues and problems that we're going to be facing, but more how we can do it in a profession that is really coming up and, and allowing us this venue to really kind of think outside the box, but more importantly, to act outside the box and your leadership will get us there. So I, um, I hope all of you are inspired to share with all of uh, your insights, all of your experiences, and how we can take this forward and make a better situation for all of us. Terrific. Um, thank you, Ron, uh, for doing that quick welcome for us. Um, I'd like to begin first with just a quick introduction from, from each of you, and then I will um, set us up with our first uh, question for this evening. Um, so if you don't mind, Vanya, I'll, I'll go ahead and begin with you. If you could just introduce yourself, let us know what uh, what program you're in. I know you're in, in ed leadership, uh, but uh, and maybe just tell us uh, where where you're currently um, uh, involved in as far as your career. Okay, um, my name is Vanya Taylor. I am um, original from El Salvador. I I have been um, an educator for 17 years and. Um, Right now, I work for Bernalillo Public Schools. I'm a bilingual coordinator, I'm a teacher too, and I'm working on my master's on leadership. And it's, um, it has been a very a good time of learning a lot and improving my, um, my knowledge and education and has been very excited. And, um, and I'm very happy to be here to, that you invite me and, and to get to know everybody from the group too. We're, we're so honored to have you. And um, I've, I've known you and I've seen you do your work for a number of years uh, at a distance. And it's just a pleasure to have you as a Ben Lujan Fellow. 
Um, it, it truly is an honor, and I think you add a lot to uh, to to the fellowship. Um, I'm going to go now to and forgive me, Marcos. Uh, I'm, I'm a traditionalist, so I'm going to I'm going to continue now with Megan. So, Miss Miss Munoz, if you could just introduce yourself briefly and share with us uh, where you're you know where you're from and and let us know a little bit about you. Yeah, hi. So I'm Megan Munoz. I'm originally from Hobbs, New Mexico. I taught there for four years uh, as a fourth grade teacher and then as a middle school PE coach. And then uh, I got the wild idea that I would go to law school. And so I graduated from law school um, this past May in the middle of the pandemic. And, um, you know, as the stars aligned, I realized that education is probably always gonna be something that I'm um, involved in. It always pulls me back. And so I uh, started this ed leadership program in August and um, it's been really just eye-opening to experience everything. And, and I'm really glad that that's an opportunity that opened up for me. I think it's gonna make all the difference in the work that I do uh, later on in education. So thank you for having me and I'm excited to be here. Absolutely, and thank you once again, yet another one of our amazing university fellows uh, through the Ben Lujan Leadership and Public Policy Institute. Marcos, you're, you're the last here, and forgive my, my traditionalism uh, as far as uh, introducing um, our, our uh, lady uh, community members first. Um, feel free. Adrian, thank you very much. I'm Marcos Maez. I'm born and raised in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I actually am majoring, uh, going for my MBA through Highlands. But I, I currently, though, am serving as the director of recruitment and dual credit programs for Santa Fe Community College. I've been working there now for over 10 years, post-secondary education, and really student equity and best serving our students and our community is something that I am extremely passionate about. It is near and dear to my heart. And even though I'm going for my MBA, it's, it's a degree that can go into public sector, private sector, I don't plan on going anywhere. This degree is just to just help me just advance where I am and just continue to not only assist the college in its mission, but also helping out students like me, who's a first generation college graduate uh, and students in my community. I really think it, it speaks to the flexibility of the, um, of the degree itself, uh, this master's in ed leadership. And uh, I think it, uh, really grounds you, I, I believe, in ultimately what you're, what you're attempting to do. With that stated, I'd, I'd like to begin with our first question. So let's take a brief moment to share what it means for you to be a Ben Luhan Leadership and Public Policy Institute uh, University Fellow, um, and describe how this fellowship is impacting your life and how it's supporting you to fulfill your goals of becoming a service leader in the educational field. Um, I'm gonna begin with you, Megan, first, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. So for me, uh, to be a Ben Lujan Leadership and Public Policy Fellow means continuing the legacy of public service uh, that's really deeply ingrained in the fabric of our state, carrying you know, the torch uh, to represent the underrepresented and making sure our ground is firmly planted in equity um, for everyone. Ben Lujan was an incredible beacon of light for our state, and I'm honored to represent him in this fellowship. You know, I see myself, I said I see myself working in education um, and that specifically has to do with policy, writing policy around education in one way or another. And this fellowship has really given me, you know, a new lens to see that work through, reflecting on different ways um, that we have leaders in education and focusing on the road between where I want us to be, where we are, um, and understanding that, you know, that's going to have an impact on educators and administrators. Um, and, you know, I just want to move the state forward. So considering how diverse our state is, is really important to me. Um, I think this program has helped me uh, really make that a, a large consideration, you know, at the forefront of, of writing policy. Um, and, you know, I've been challenged to think about the impact of that work. And with, you know, with regard to leadership. And so um, I know that the road ahead is very long. And I think this um, program has really inspired me. You know, it's exhausted me. And I'm just ripe with gratitude from the whole experience so far. That's, that's outstanding. Thank you for those amazing words, really. You know, the whole notion of being a service leader 
and really thinking about equity and education throughout our state and taking that into the classroom as a university fellow and really looking beyond, you know, within the next three years, four years, the impact you potentially will have as a, uh, really, the, I, I'm beginning to look at you and, and forgive me if I'm incorrect, but as, as, as an educational lawyer, right? And, and a, a potential educational leader that has that, that, uh, that deep level understanding uh, from a policy perspective, from a legal perspective, and also from uh, that service leadership perspective that we're definitely trying to inculcate um, as, as part of the program. Uh, I thank you, Megan. I'm gonna move over to Marcos now, if you don't mind, Marcos. Absolutely, Adrian, thank you very much. So to be a Ben Lujan Fellow, for me, it, it just it symbolizes something that it makes it possible for somebody like me to go to college, for somebody like me to continue my post-secondary education. Again, as I stated in my introduction, I'm the first person in my family to graduate from college. I'm the first person in my family to actually complete any type of a semester in college. And I had a very, very supportive family that just nudged me and pushed me along the way. So I'm very grateful for them. But to be a Ben Lujan fellow, it means for me that, like I said earlier, it, it helps just continue to help me fulfill my goals, fulfill my dreams. I graduated with my bachelor's degree from UNM in 2008. And I told myself then, yeah, okay, I'm going to take a year or two off and I'll go for my master's degree. Well, two years obviously turned into uh, 10 years, turned into 11 years. And I kept telling myself over and over again, okay, I'll go for my master's this year. But always some excuse came up and it was all man-made. It was all, I, I made up every excuse and something, and something like the Ben Lujan fellowship really helped push me to start, just get this going, just dunk, dip my toe in the water. I'm very fortunate that I, I have a very good paying job at the college and I love what I do but I have a mortgage, I have many, many expenses, so college was still going to be a challenge. This Ben Lujan Fellowship, again, makes it possible for me to be able to continue in my education and to be that person, that role model for people in my community. Absolutely. Um, I, I love what I'm hearing because basically uh, what you're suggesting is that uh, by having this, this level of support, it helps you fulfill your dream that ultimately contributes uh, to our society, to our communities in ways um, that, that are beyond, um, you know, initially what perhaps you had imagined. It really solidifies, solidifies forgive me, your career, and um, it supports you through this lens of, of adult education and just how difficult it is sometimes for us when we have those adult responsibilities of having a family or having a mortgage, as you mentioned, and all of a sudden, you know, here's this amazing opportunity to help us to begin to fulfill our dreams that in turn supports us to fulfill the dreams of others. And so um, I think that's simply outstanding, Marcos. Uh, I think Ben Lujan Sr. Uh, would be uh, just amazingly content uh, with the two stories that have been mentioned so far uh, about both of you as fellows. And that leaves us with you, Vanya. Um, it, it, why don't you share with us a little bit about um, what the, the fellowship means to you, what, how it's impacted your life, and how it's really supporting you to fulfill your goals of becoming a service leader in the educational field. Yeah, thank you, Adrian. Yes, uh, for me, um, it is an honor to be part of the Ben Lujan Fellow. I am grateful that um, I have been given the opportunity to achieve my goals, my professional goals. As um, Mr. Maya says, sometimes life happens and uh, you have the desire to continue, but there are other things on your way that don't allow you. And I, it's what I thought for a long time. I, I have been teaching for 17 years. And for a long time, I thought, well, this is it. I'm, I'm not gonna be able to go beyond this, but um, with Belhan Fellowship, I'll open up that door. And that was awesome. And I'm very grateful for that. I wanna be a competent educational leader and Ben Lujan opened the door for me to do that. So, um, and that's the vision of the Ben Lujan Fellowship is uh, to 
help and support the um, educators to be competent, to give back to the community and um, to create those healthy learning environments. And I embrace that vision too, is what I want. I consider myself, um, um, I'm in the service of the community. So I want to make my community a better place for everybody. And it's what Ben Lujan wants too. So I am honored to be part of it. And I'm honored that uh, um, they are helping me and I'm grateful. I'm just so thankful for your service as, as an educator for the past 17 years. And as I've mentioned, I, I was you know, lucky enough to be privileged to provide and observe uh, the efforts that you made within your district to be inclusive of the communities that your district serves and to really try to partner and invite individuals in. Um, I see, I've, in other words, I've witnessed all of what you describe here, which is such so much a part of the core and the essence of the Ben Lujan Fellowship. Um, that, that notion of giving to community, being a service leader, um, really thinking about um, the, the realities of, of diverse diversities, the intersectionalities that we encounter in our communities and, and being accessible to all of those, those individuals, uh, being in, uh, accessible through, to all of those families and, and to those students and making a difference in, in those lives um, and doing it in a way that's, that's truly equitable and uh, with, with an eye towards quality. And so thank you so much, Vanya, for sharing your story um, and, and for being uh, that educational leader already um, that you are uh, within your school district as, as the bilingual coordinator there. Um, I'm gonna now segue. I, I think it's a great, great way for us to segue because it, you know, talking about a bilingual coordinator and specifically about a school site that, that focuses once again on this notion of instruction. Um, and the second question that I have for all of you is really what has been some of the positives? Uh, what have been some of the positives of virtual learning for you as a graduate student? And uh, what can be celebrated? So I'm, I'm gonna start off with that. And, uh, and just to give you a few ideas, I mean, things like, ha have you noticed your faculty or our faculty at NMHU, uh, their ability to be agile, to be flexible and to be able to move into this uh, virtual reality? Um, are there any particular strategies or approaches that you've enjoyed? Um, the flexibility that's offered through a virtual reality, uh, whether it be synchronous or asynchronous modes and the, the ease of transition perhaps that NMHU was really uh, able to support us all with. Um, so I'm just throwing out a few ideas there. Um, I'm gonna start off with, with you, Vanya. Uh, you spoke last, I'm, I'm gonna keep you, um, you know, focused on, on sharing, so please. Yes, definitely one of the things uh, to celebrate is that all the circumstances we're living on, they haven't stopped us. We have continued and um, the flexibility we had even before to um, being able to have online classes or face-to-face -face classes. So that was very good because the transition was not difficult. I, for me, I liked it to be with you know, with the people and uh, the other students. And I really enjoyed that. And I remember when I was in my class, but I was able to see other students in, in other places in New Mexico, right? And, and we were like sharing and in that dynamic that was so natural and uh, has been a good thing that now that we all are in the virtual, virtual learning um, continues. So I am I'm very happy that the transition was not difficult. It was easy and the teachers were already used to this. So they're very great, um, grateful with, uh, with all of us giving us what we need and, and that's something to celebrate. That's excellent. Wow. Um, and I, I have to tell you that not many universities can say that. Um, that and, and the thing that stood out for me was your comment that uh, for many of the, your professors, it was very easy for them to transition from the, the physical real-time world of being in a physical classroom uh, to the virtual mode. Um, and really it was, it was up to us to a certain degree to fully transition as students um, in that direction. But, um, and what I'm hearing from you is you had kind of like a combination perhaps of some of your classes being live in, in a physical classroom and live in a virtual reality. And so when, when we went, excuse me, when we went completely virtual, it was just a very smooth transition. 
So um, yeah, that's that's nice to hear. Um, I want to I want to move over to Marcos now. Same question: um, What have been some of the positives of virtual learning for you as a graduate student, and what can be celebrated? Absolutely, Adrian. So for me, it's convenience. Again, I think all of us on this panel, I think we're all working adults. We all have full-time jobs where we have major obligations. And the virtual environment, again, makes it possible for us to be able to go to school. Uh, that's, for me, my degree was 100% virtual anyway. But it is funny though. So I started my MBA program in fall 2019. And again, completely virtual, very convenient. The faculty were fantastic, always very responsive as they have been ever since. But just something funny happened when we went completely to virtual learning and, and many of us working from home in March of 2020. It was almost psychological where it was really hard, especially those first few weeks for me to get back into the groove of things. Now I still was doing the work, I still was going to class, but there just was something very strange. I mean, it was just obviously the, the pandemic is, is horrifying uh, for many, many different reasons, but there was just almost something like, it was a bummer and, and it's, so even working from home, uh, so, cause I started working from home, but even going to school from home during that time, it, it took some adjusting. And I just applaud the faculty that I was working with um, and, and ever since, they've been available via text message, they've been available via email. Uh, anytime that I've had any type of question or any type of need, I have always valued that they are very gracious and they are always willing to give their time to answer questions. So I, my experience uh, being a virtual student, and this is the first time that I've ever been a student virtually uh, in my academic career, has been very, very refreshing. Now, like Vanya, I, I very much prefer to be in a live classroom, being able to interact with people. But I'll tell you what though, the virtual experience at Highlands has been really, really good. Wow, that's, that's tremendous. Um, and I, I think the thing that stands out to me um, is the, the above and beyond that I'm hearing you talk about. Um, so uh, having our faculty at NMHU reach out, um, reach out to you in a variety of different ways and try to make that, uh, um, that whole transition um, and not necessarily the transition to virtual in your particular case, but that transition of working at home and all those different realities that begin to impact, the, impact forgive me, the virtual environment that wasn't perhaps impacting it previously. In other words, being in a virtual environment all day and then being in a virtual environment for your coursework as well is just adding adding to that whole experience and that whole transition to, to a, a different reality and mode for, for all of us. And what I'm hearing from you is that you had friendly ears, you had friendly support um, and individuals that are willing to go above and beyond uh, to make sure that the learning experience was accessible for you. Um, that's, that's outstanding. Um, that leaves me with you, Megan, same question. Some positive, positive virtual learning experiences that you've had, what can you celebrate? Yeah, I've, uh, I'm going to echo a lot of what Vanya and Marco said, um, you know, just really getting to attend uh, from my home, from the comfort of my home has been great. Um, it's cut down on travel time and the scheduling stress that, that, you know, is surrounded with that. And, you know, I'm really, I've really been impressed. My only, this was my first semester. Um, and so my only comparison um, is law school. And I can tell you, you know, the comparison is much more enjoyable, even in a virtual setting. Um, just the professors and, and colleagues in my classes have, you know, found ways to make virtual learning enjoyable. You know, the transparency of being, you know, like, I don't know what I'm doing, but let's figure out how to do it together. Um, you know, am I sharing my screen, you know, just, just the, the hiccups that have come along the way have really, you know, they, they take away the, I guess the, the superiority that professors have in classes, you know, they're just humans. And so I think it's made it a lot, you know, just easier of a transition for me, um, going virtual and being in the pandemic. It's just, 
you know, it's the, the expectations haven't changed. We're still doing small groups. We're still, you know, we still have posts. We still have assignments, uh, but the flexibility in those things have, have definitely um, changed. And, and I think, you know, I agree with Vanya saying that I miss the interaction, the, you know, the person to person interaction, but, you know, I can understand that the priority is, is for everyone to stay safe. So I commend all of the faculty um, and my colleagues in my classes that have been flexible with doing that. I think it's something to celebrate too. Wow. Yeah, no, thank you so much for all three of you for sharing what you've shared. And Megan, uh, I guess the two areas that I can uh, um, uh, piggyback on would be uh, the, just this notion of flexibility and the humanity that uh, that you feel is being brought into uh, the virtual reality. And so um, th those, again, kudos to to NMHU and kudos to, to our faculty for um, uh, supporting you all to feel this positive about, about a difficult transition in many instances. Um, and that, that leads me now to question number three. Um, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll begin with you, Megan, uh, since we ended off with you. And, and that would be, have you noticed any gaps or areas in need of improvement relative to virtual learning at NMHU? And if so, what are they? And offer some recommendations to improve. Uh, because obviously, I mean, that's one of the reasons why we always leave uh, whenever we do some kind of a uh, of a professional learning opportunity, a training, even a class, um, we have those opportunities for evaluation. And so this is a great forum uh, for us to give uh, some thought uh, about what are some areas uh, that can be approved, improved and what are some of the recommendations you have? Yeah, so as I reflect on this question, I think it's my mind immediately goes to student support um, and I don't necessarily think that I have enough information about the student support services that are offered, but just from my own experience and being in these unprecedented times, I think that um, I missed the opportunity to like stay after class and talk about what somebody said, um, you know, and just be like, let's unpack that a little bit. What did you mean by that? And, um, you know, the the networking that that brings and, and the, the community that that builds, I think is something that I felt was more challenging to do in a virtual setting because you're like, oh, I gotta leave now. Um, or, you know, you want, you're talking over everybody to get that one person. Um, so it's not necessarily, you know, conducive to, to network in the same way that we're used to in, in the person to person setting. Um, you know, I, I said that that was my, um, the fall was my first semester, and so I didn't I didn't know anyone in the education leadership class. I didn't know anyone in my classes, um, and so my recommendation would be um, just to maybe consider the assignments and and ways to make that possible in class. So. Um, you know, maybe if the discussion posts were like Zoom meetings and, you know, mixed in with um, the actual like internet um, discussion post on Brightspace, that might be something that can can supplement the um, networking and the person to person contact in the um, in the program. And um, yeah, that's I mean, to me, I think that that has been a gap for me and that's probably the best way that I can think of to address it. Um, but I'm sure there's tons of other um, ways to, to get that in-person interaction too. That's, that's a fantastic recommendation, wonderful feedback. And really, I think as, as we describe these things, uh, my, my um, Ben Luhan fellows, as we describe these things, we're really on the cutting edge. We're on the cusp of, making recommendations around how virtual learning can be um, even so much more uh, effective. Uh, and in this particular instance, what you're tapping into is that, that again, that sense of community at the end of a class uh, where we're able to network and reflect and really what we're doing when we're networking and reflecting, we're deepening our roots of understanding um, uh, with our colleagues. And so we're, we're actually co-creating knowledge um, at, at the end of those classes um, and, and collaborating around that knowledge, right? Those deeper understandings. I very much value that. Thank you, Megan. Um, and with that stated, I'm gonna move over to, um, to Vanya. If you don't mind, Vanya, same question. Um, what are some gaps that you've noticed in areas in need of improvement perhaps uh, relative to virtual learning at NMHU? And what are your recommendations? Um, yeah, when I was thinking about that, um, 
because of all the things we're living right now, everything that is happening with the pandemic, um, the social emotional learning has taken uh, relevance. And I never been, I was never in a training before for social emotional, emotional learning before, but now before starting this school year, we, we went through this training and uh, it has been a challenge for us as, um, as a schools to how can we integrate that? Because it's not that it was not important before, but um, it is important definitely at this time. So um, we, we have been trying to integrate it into our um, classes with our students. So I was thinking that that would be something good to at this level, how can we integrate that social emotional learning in the classes? Because at the end, we are the role models for our students. Like I feel I need to, oh, I need to have those skills. I'm the one who's going to be modeling for the next generation for our students. So I think it's something important that should be integrated, maybe a challenge, because it has been a challenge for me. Um, but it, I think it's, it is important and it should be, it should be everywhere. It should be in pre-K all the way to higher level education too. That's Great. my only recommendation. Absolutely, no, uh, developing those interpersonal skills, right? Uh, that those, those skill sets that are so valuable that, that not only are critical um, with, within our classrooms in, uh, in the K-12 environments uh, amongst our students, but also uh, with ourselves as adults and how do we develop those those uh, critical skill sets of uh, that that social emotional give and take uh, that's so required in our interpersonal interactions uh, with each other on a daily basis, and how do we begin to to further develop that repertoire that that we have? I think it's truly valuable, and actually, it's connected to what Megan was sharing a little bit earlier, right? Um, uh, in really getting opportunities to to build community, and as you build community, you have uh, deeper connections to understanding within the classroom. Um, I see how all of this is interrelated. Absolutely fas fascinating, and I and I value your thoughts. Um, with that, I I'd like to go over to you, Marcos. What are your thoughts on this? Any recommendations, thoughts on gaps or areas of improvement? One recommendation that I would have is, and this is just because I this is one of the main things that I miss about being in a live classroom environment, and that's that we could have more of an opportunity to students to have discussions. And what I've noticed is when we do have our online classes, and I absolutely understand why the instructor just needs to do the lecture and get out as much material for that day as possible. But I would absolutely appreciate, because I do miss that opportunity for students to interact with each other. And that could be interacting in the big virtual classroom setting, or that could be breakout groups. In the time that I've been in um, the classes that I've been in, I haven't had the opportunity for that. So I definitely miss that. I, I really have not had the opportunity to get to know any of my peers, any of my fellow classmates. Normally it's we're in the virtual classroom and the instructor lectures, there's Q and A opportunity for questions and answers, but that's it. But I definitely truly do miss having the opportunity to speak to my fellow classmates and get to know them a little bit better. Other than that though, I, I just think that uh, the virtual environment through NMHU has been incredible. Nice. Now what I'm hearing from all three of you is, is just really potentially adding uh, to, to the amazing quality that we're already experiencing. And um, what you're suggesting of adding or uh, is, is really on the, on the level of, of the social interaction, the humanity, the, the community building. Um, and it, of course, I mean, the trade-off through that is uh, the deeper level uh, of understanding, because again, those are opportunities to co-create meaning um, uh, and um, uh, really develop that deeper level understanding of those really abstract ideas and concepts that we typically are dealing with uh, within our undergrad and our graduate school, particularly in this case, uh, level coursework. Um, and so I, I very much value that. That's, that's superb, you know, saying that uh, uh, really what we're looking for here is uh, that, that really that social side, that human side of being able to interact with each other. Um, and you've given multiple recommendations, whether it be 
uh, through uh, you know video video recording, whether it be through just some uh, online chat sessions and, and kind of like a, a separate Zoom environment or breakout sessions within Zoom itself uh, to really begin to use our voice and hear the voice of others and to develop those relationships that are so critical that uh, um, that those opportunities to uh, um, to to just build those networks as uh, Megan was mentioning a little bit more. And of course, while we're doing that, we're developing our social emotional skills as Vani was alluding to. Uh, so oh, fantastic, I, I love it. You're, you're, all three of you were very concise, very pointed uh, in the directions that you would hope to see um, uh, the, the virtual learning continue to, to grow and expand, right, and evolve. Uh, and that's not just here. Uh, I really think it's more likely across the nation, but I, I really do believe that NMHU is on the cusp of, of really supporting in the virtual world uh, and are far beyond a number of other, other universities. Um, I'm ready now for question number four. Um, and this question number four, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send out to you directly, Marco, since you're the last one to speak here. Um, and let me just preface it by saying, well, in recent, uh, with recent demands for racial and social justice across our country, there's been a greater affinity and desire to shift practices. Um, and really we've begun to, to think about as institutions of higher education, we've begun to think about how we're gonna shift those practices, right? Now, so what are your thoughts on the need for culturally and linguistically responsive educational practices in higher education within our virtual learning environments? What do you think? Adrian, I really appreciate this question. And there is an absolute necessity right now for equity in virtual learning environment or even outside of that. But this is something that is very, very, that I take personally. I'm seeing it affecting students in our community here in Northern New Mexico. We're seeing students now that once we got into the virtual learning environment, they really didn't have any real options to continue in their education. Many, many of our students don't have access to computers other than their smartphones. Many of those students may not have Wi-Fi or any type of internet at home. So we're seeing students um, going into our parking lots because we're allowing students into the Santa Fe Community College parking lots and they're accessing our hotspots and they're actually doing their classes in the parking lot. Now, I applaud these students for showing the grit and determination for just being that determined to continuing their education and not quitting. I applaud that. I truthfully, I don't know if I could have done that if I was a 21, 22 year old student. And I'm inspired by that, but I'm also very sad to see that that's what it takes for a lot of our students to continue their education. And what is the answer? And we also are seeing students too that maybe they have access to a Google Chromebook, but that Chromebook doesn't allow students to download Zoom or doesn't allow them to download Microsoft Teams. What if those are the only platforms that that institution are doing their lectures in? Um, so that's a really hard question. And for me, I mean, I just personally would hope and wish that we could just find a way with faculty and staff and college leadership to just put our heads together to see how we can, and obviously our IT departments, to put our heads together to see how we can best serve the needs of our students. Because time and time again, we ask our students to be college ready. But I think it's more important now more than ever for us to be student ready. We need to meet our students' needs and we need to address those needs. And there's a lot of good, but there's also a lot of ugly going on right now. And we have to be willing to have those types of conversations and be honest and say, here's how this is affecting our community. Now, it's great that we're doing remote online learning and a lot of us are benefit, benefiting from it, but a lot of students aren't. How can we meet those students' needs? Now, that's wonderful. I'm, and what I'm hearing from you is, is just a, a, a shout out, a, a, an encouragement for us to come together as higher um, institutions of higher education and really think about you know, what are, and problem solve, right? Um, develop solutions in a very proactive way, um, not only as we continue out through this uh, particular semester, um, but also in potentially, you know, future semesters or just um, it, with the reality of our continued expansion um, as far as making um, um, 
education in higher education available through the virtual world, right? The virtual lens. Um, and so we really need to be thoughtful about that um, as we proceed on uh, in our journey through the 21st century um, and be proactive about it. That's, that's what I'm hearing from you is that it, it takes action and it takes some brainstorming together as communities. Um, I thank you for that, Marcos. Um, I'm gonna move over to uh, Vanya. Uh, would you mind sharing on this? Um, so what are your thoughts on the need for culturally and linguistically responsive educational practices in higher education uh, uh, it's uh, higher education's virtual learning environments. Forgive me. Yeah, um, well, when I think about cultural and linguistic responsive, responsive education, I think about an education that validates and um, reflect on um, the diversity, the identity, the, um, the experiences that the students have. And I like how Marcos also approached the the other needs that the student have. I mean, what we want really is to have our eyes open and ears open for the needs and listen to our students and validate what they bring um, to our institutions, to our schools. And uh, so I, I think that, yeah, we need to um, be open for being responsible and cultural, linguistically, social cultural uh, competence too. And, um, and it goes, it's, I will say something multidimensional that is not just the instruction itself. It's like, we're talking about materials. We're talking about attitudes. We're talking about the whole culture of the schools, the whole culture of institutions. So um, the, it's something that I think that it needs to be integrated in every institution, educational institution needs to really work on it and integrate it. And, I like how um, the classes I'm taking have given me the opportunity to express myself. I am um, coming from another country, so I'm, I'm bringing different experiences. Um, and I like how the dynamic in our classes, the classes I have been participating, give me the opportunity to express myself. And that has been very, um, um, very good for me as a person. I feel validated, I feel appreciated. And I think it's what everybody wants to feel. And then you perform even better. When, when you feel that way, you perform even better. So we wanna see that from our students too. So I appreciate that Highlands is giving me that opportunity. I think that my I am the one who's building my education. I feel the professors are facilitators and, uh, and I really appreciate that. No, I, I love what you're saying as well, Vanya. This, especially the comment that I want to hone in on is this idea of being valued and appreciated um, because that is truly the essence of, of a culturally and linguistically responsive educational practice. Um, as you mentioned, when you first began your, your sharing, it was really talking to this idea of how do we value the, the cultural funds of knowledge uh, that our students bring into the classroom? How do we value um, and express that value for their cultural identity, their linguistic identities? Um, and how do we create an environment where these individuals feel um, validated on a daily basis for the prior knowledge that is, is intermixed with that, those cultural and linguistic realities that may be different from the mainstream that they bring into that classroom, which are amazing gems that really add to the complexity and the depth of knowledge and understanding that the rest of us can bring and take away from, from that classroom. Um, and, and I feel like you really zeroed in on, on, on the essence of, of what culturally and linguistically responsive educational practices are. And what I'm hearing from you is that you feel uh, that you're you're experiencing some of that in in the coursework that you're taking at NMHU, and that's outstanding. That's super because that suggests that as our, as educational leaders, after graduating, we're going to create similar environments within the school communities that we now are leading, um, and that's just such a critical uh, a critical gift, an amazing gift that pays forward um, uh, through generations. And forgive me, you 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 encouraged me to get on a on a soapbox there, and I apologize. Um, Megan, I want you to round us out on this question number four. Any thoughts on the need for culturally and linguistically 
responsive educational practices in our virtual environments. Yeah, I'm glad that you just said and acknowledged that you were on a soapbox because I think I'm gonna get on my <laughs> own here. Um, yeah, I agree a lot with what Marco said about the barriers um, that have been placed uh, and that have been brought to light with the with the current experience that we're in. Um, from my perspective and, and my background um, and study in the law, this is really an area that I have found to be um, very, I'm very passionate about. Um, to me, I think owning, uh, without owning the reality that education has been used as a tool for oppression, um, we can't fully embrace and reconcile our future in education. And so, you know, that's where culturally and linguistically responsive educational practices begin to take back that oppressive tool and wield it as, you know, a weapon to make education accessible for all. And I think that's where the equity grounding that I spoke of earlier, um, I think that's where it starts. And, you know, to me, New Mexico has a long history of language pres preservation as well as contributions to language extinction. We see that in the language of our state constitution that was taken from the Guadalupe Hildago Treaty that recognized Spanish as something that needed to stay. And we also see it in that same document in native communities that have been impacted by the compulsory school attendance um, statutes. So, these are both hopeful and hard truths that we have to we have to address in higher education. Um, virtually or not, I think the point should be made to keep that history alive with the intention of never repeating the inferiority caused by those oppressive practices. And you know, to me, um, we we know if you you know if you know about education and you know about social health determinatives, you know that education is the number one social health determinative to break the cycles of poverty in our communities. So it has been both a gift and a curse in its history. Higher education's role, in my opinion, in that is to help reconcile that fact, ask the questions of whether students see those functions and then challenge students to notice them throughout the lessons the entire semester. It shouldn't just be a one hit and quit topic. This should be a theme. As, you, as we're moving through our education, that should be a topic of conversation at all levels, in all areas. That's the situation that we're in right now because people have not acknowledged that and they've never been, it's never been placed in their face like that. Um, it's easy to disregard it and it's easy to say it's not happening. But to ask the questions, how, how are students recognizing this history that's embedded in these ideologies of education, of any topic really, um, whether these racial disparities have kept marginalized communities from achieving social justice and how that's happened. Disparities, you know, are in every area of education. We can see that in its history. If we just talk about it, maybe we can start chipping away at those things that we want to change in our future, the, what we're going to take our higher education to do. Um, I think that um, the future in education, you know, our future as students can, can, we can help it or we can hinder it with those truths by the goals that we establish, by the expectations that we set for ourselves in higher education and beyond. So for me, um, this isn't just needed, it's crucial. We have to have it to move forward. It's really the only way to acknowledge it and build on it to create a better future. That's outstanding. All of you have been so powerful this evening and I thank you so much. Um, just this, this idea of you know, really recognizing that being in a multicultural and multilingual state, that it, it's always been that way, this region um, and really, if you think about it, all of the U.S. really at, at one point or another with our indigenous populations was so wonderfully complex culturally and linguistically. And yet through our educational efforts, sometimes, many times, unfortunately, historically, we've deliberately tried to rid ourselves of the, that, that, that amazing beauty and those gifts that have given so much back to, to our country, whether it be with the Navajo Code Talkers, right? 
uh, whether it be with uh, uh, the, the, the Comanches, the, uh, the Cherokee people, um, the, the, the Oneidas, uh, when I think of uh, the Northern Northeastern nations that really gave us our sense of democracy that was slightly different than what was being perceived in Western Europe at the time. Um, and really made what, what we think about, um, uh, you know, here in our country is it's, it's slightly different. And these communities way back when were already recognizing and valuing uh, the, the, the female side of their communities as being leaders and being powerful and having crucial points and voices to go ahead and share uh, within, within their communities. Um, I, I thank you so much for that, uh, Megan and, and Marcos and Vanya, for all that you've shared this evening. Um, I'm wondering, uh, I'm, I'm down to our last question here, and really it's an open-ended piece, and it gives us, all of us, an opportunity for closure. Um, so any final thoughts, surprises, um, relative to virtual learning, relative to our conversation this morning, any ahas, um, uh, this afternoon, forgive me. Um, I, I'm just kind of curious, uh, and feel free to, to jump in. Who, who would like to begin? And I can't see you all, so before I ask that, let me change my view here. Um, and so between Marcos and Vanya and, and Megan, which one of you like to begin to, to close us off this evening? I'll give you two minutes, roughly. Anyone? Go ahead, Megan. I just talked a lot, but I'll keep talking. <laughs> um, you know, I'm just, I'm always surprised by the determination of educators and it's really, you know, if there's a way we'll find it, um, won't we? It, it seems like that's been the experience, um, especially in, in this pandemic, in this um, time of, of social unrest. I think both professors and, and colleagues have uh, exceeded my expectations in their ability to adapt. And virtual learning has given me uh, particularly the opportunity to step back and be more patient with myself and really um, be more patient with others as we all fill out this new world. And so I just want to express how grateful I am, you know, for the for the flexibility and transparent transparency and the continued support that Highlands has offered me. Uh, it's truly been you know, just a learning experience on top of a learning experience. So I really appreciate uh, all of that. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, Marcos, or Vanya, I, it seems like you're ready. I'm sorry, Vanya. Sorry, Marcos. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. Oh, well, I'm, I just want to say that um, I am very surprised that I am adapting so well to this virtual learning. I honestly never thought I was going to say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm liking it. I'm, I'm okay. I'm feeling good with it. I'm not missing anything. I don't feel that, oh, because we're in this environment, I'm not really getting what I should get from my classes. I'm not really learning what I should be learning. I don't feel that way. And I'm actually adapting. And, um, and I think that um, we're probably going to continue with this and we're going to get better and better. And that's uh, something to celebrate and, and surprises me to say that because I never thought I was going to say it. But, um, but it's something, it, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. And I have seen it also at the school settings. I see how teachers are getting so creative and getting so better and better on teaching virtual. And, and, and I'm, I'm proud of all, of all the educators for that. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm uh, again, I'm going to state it one more time, actually probably two more times, but I'm going to state it right now. I'm so amazingly proud of, of um, how you all have, have shared your thoughts this evening. Um, and Marcos, uh, before I, uh, I continue to uh, throw praise on all three of you, um, feel free to take over the conversation now, please. I guess for me, what, what, what I've learned about myself in, in an online learning environment is that I'm very happy that I can do it. And I echo everything Vanya and Megan are saying. I am a student that, I mean, my pre-MBA program, I've always been very confident and I've never really been that intimidated with um, the first day of class. I actually look forward to it, but that was in a live environment. Once I knew that I was going to be in a 100% online program, it scared the heck out of me. I will not lie. It was intimidating because it was something that I had never done before. 
And I just did not know how I was going to be able to successfully adapt to this. So I'm very surprised that, um, knock on wood, that I've done as well as I have thus far. Um, and I've actually enjoyed it much more than I ever thought I would. I'm somebody that really, and, and again, I think we all have said this, and I'll just say this again, loves to be in a live environment with people. And I love to be able to present to people and speak directly to people. So that's one thing that still I haven't been able to fully adapt to is even doing this panel. I know I could do a much better job if I was actually in person feeding off of the energy of the room. But even in, in my professional life and my school life, talking to a machine, and I know that there are people out there that can hear me and see me, it's just so awkward and so hard for me to get used to. But the fact that I've been able to succeed in this environment, uh, and it was going to be virtual pandemic or no pandemic, but just the fact that I've been able to succeed really just makes me very, very happy. And I just applaud any student who um, is in the uh, online learning environment. I, I really, really do, because it's, it's not the easiest thing to adapt to. Absolutely. Um, and uh, no, I'm just so thankful again for everything that you have shared in such, uh, all three of you that you've shared in such a professional manner. Um, I'd like to thank uh, New Mexico Highlands University um, and the Spring Development Days, specifically Veronica Black, uh, for uh, having the trust in us as, in you all as Ben Luhan Fellows, in us as the Center for the Education and Study of Diverse Populations at New Mexico Highlands University, the Ben Luhan Leadership and Public Policy Institute connected to CESDP. Um, you all have done an amazing job of showing the quality of, of individuals that we have within our fellows um, and our university fellows. And, and we're just so thrilled to have been able to have uh, been given this opportunity this evening. And uh, you, your light is shining, all three of you. And I wish you nothing but a, a, a wonderful semester. And I'm sure you wish the same for your for your faculty that are there in the trenches with you, uh, supporting you all. Yeah, give them, give them a, a shout out, give them a, a thumbs up. Uh, they're there for you. They they're truly are committed. Uh, Ron, I'm not sure if you'd like to share one last thought and uh, uh, also Veronica, feel free. Briefly, I'd like to just say thank you again to all the panelists. I think your insights have been brilliantly displayed and, and expressed in ways that will help us be more in tune with what really the realities that we all spoke about. Um, it's just insightful to know that as students, you're succeeding. And more important, I think it's a reflection of your own capacity and the caliber of what you're learning is going to be manifested into your classrooms and into your courtrooms and into your, uh, you know, any, any spaces that you're going to be occupying, I think the leadership that we're developing is really manifesting in all of what you expressed and how it's being done through these challenging times for all of us. And uh, again, I just want to express a sincere thank you and gratitude for all of you for taking of your time today to really express that. And also, Adrian, I'd like to really share that with you as well for um, taking on the leadership role of designing and developing this out so that we can get that kind of good proverbial vibe out there so that our instructors and our colleges of education and our business colleges can all start learning from that. I think from the insights that you all shared is that this particular learning style and, and learning concepts have to be embedded into the entire university system, not just with the School of Education, but in every one of the content areas that we, that we um, express ourselves in, in, in education. I know education is one of those archaic and slow moving institutions, kind of like religious or religion is, but again, these are the opportunities. And I think the way that you're all handling it as the students is, is superior to how I know it's going to manifest in the future. So again, thank you for a good, Good job, well done. Thank you all. Way to go, Ben Luan fellows. Animate you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Good job, guys. Yeah, thank you so much.
Okay, thank Veronica. you so much for participating. Um, yeah, yeah, sorry, Adrian. Uh, just uh, want to say thank you for participating in this evening. And we are right on time. So um, I, I do appreciate your time. I will be sure to uh, share this video with you as soon as it is posted onto our website, um, along with um, some of the other programs that we will be um, sharing with our faculty on Tuesday and Wednesday of next week. Um, I really appreciate your time um, and learning a lot more about this program. Um, I knew it existed, uh, but only on paper. And to see your faces and hear your stories has really made this fellowship uh, like really come to life. Um, and, and something that is, uh, I, I will be talking about the experience of learning about it uh, to my colleagues. So thank you. And thank you, Adrian, for helping put this together. I think this is really great to, uh, to have these uh, multiple voices during these professional development moments. I think it is really great to have as many voices from different different perspectives and across the different institutions, because uh, I think that's it's it's all about how we develop. So I think I, I think we're developing a new trend, Veronica, without a doubt. And wait, uh, I I just want to say something. This is just our. Don't we get like two more takes on this? I want to make sure it looks. Oh okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just playing. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to stop and then we're going to start again. Um, <laughs> We're here all night. Um, <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye, y'all. This was perfect. Yes. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Good evening. Good evening.